live. All right, thank you. Uh, it's a pretty unusual circumstance for me to be mute. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that you either got up early in the morning or joining us at lunchtime if you're on the East Coast or if you're somewhere else. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day. Good, I'm glad you can hear me. If my volume goes down or up, please just uh, shoot me a, a message, and I'll try to keep an eye on that. All right, um, let's get started. And I want to add that there. Okay. Um, the only thing I want to add to Sue's very kind introduction is that we don't compare or rank, award or reward, endorse or promote any company. And that gives me leave then to go ahead and talk about companies because you know that in advance. Um, our agenda for today, I'm going to give you uh, first, I want to hear introductions from you all, not very lengthy, and introduce you to Ambient Insights Research Taxonomy. Then I'll share some high-level key findings from our new report and then go into a little bit, which is also in the report, into who's buying, what they're buying, go over some catalysts and some challenges to the market, and also some trends. Oh, by the way, you can download the slides. Uh, we'll post them on our website um, by Friday, so you don't have to worry about trying to write down everything that's here because there are 30 slides, and that would be an invitation to writer's cramp. So our taxonomy. Um, we have a taxonomy that identifies our foundation for how we create our market forecasts. Uh, we address seven regions in the world and eight different buyer segments. Now, we separate K through 12 from higher education because of the obvious differences between them. It wouldn't do suppliers as much good just to say, well, here's the academic market if you're interested in producing products for K through 12 or K through two, or higher ed. And we identify these buyer segments that buy eight different types of learning, digital learning products. Now, today is sort of a combination, game-based learning and mobile learning. And we identify these products from six different types of suppliers. And our taxonomy is on our website, and I strongly advise that you Look at that. Uh, it's about a 30-page document that defines our products and also defines our how we look at the buyers and also information about the different buyer types. Now, before I go any further, um, I'm going to go up to the poll, and I'd like to get a sense of where you all are from. I already know that Robert is... It's Robert, who is from Nova Scotia, and like the poll. So if you would just quickly vote, give you a minute to do this, what region that you're in, um, because the poll only handles five questions, I had to group Eastern and Western Europe and Asia and the Middle East. So um, choose your location. Please then submit your vote. Click the Submit Vote button. And I see 38 from North America. Not real surprising. And I'm going to give you just another second and to stop voting. Okay. So, North America. Well, it makes sense because the report really is on North America, but of course it's very, the, there are things that are relevant to the worldwide market, and I'll be mentioning those as I go along. There's a difference in our view between game-based learning and gamification. We use the gamification definition from Sponge Lab, which is a science learning community. Game-based learning for us is a knowledge transfer method that utilizes gameplay, some form of competition, and a reward and penalty system. And game-based learning products, or edgy games, have explicit pedagogical goals. Gamification is a more casual approach to games and where a game elements are added on to a training product or another product. It, gamification is becoming so popular that even subjects like accounting are engaging in gamification. Uh, the Khan Academy uses game, gamification. Oxford University Press uses Secret Builder's social game platform for children. For, 
some of their content. So gamification is certainly growing, but we look at it more narrowly when we do our forecasts. Now, for mobile edgy games or mobile game-based learning, we define six different types of edgy games, and we forecast revenues for each of these. Knowledge-based games, learning about something, skill-based games, learning how to do something, which is how to do math, brain trainers and cognitive fitness, language learning games, location-based learning games, which are really on the increase, and mobile augmented reality games, which didn't increase in the last uh, year as much as we expected. And again, um, at the end of this presentation, I have the link to our taxonomy also, and I really suggest that you dig into that a little bit. So this is really how we view uh, the different product types. Now, some high-level findings from our report. Uh, the bottom line is that consumers are definitely driving this market worldwide, but also in North America. Compound annual growth rate for the global game-based market is 8%. North America, it's a little higher. It's 12.5%. The revenues are going to nearly double from $227.97 million in 2013 to $410.27 million by 2018. As I've said before and will say probably several times during this presentation, consumers are the top buyers of edgy game package content. And early childhood edgy games are definitely the top seller, and this will be true throughout the forecast period. Now, one thing that is not in North America is mobile learning value-added services. Telecoms and device makers and NGOs, but particularly telecoms, are providing these worldwide, particularly strong in Asia, Latin America, and Africa. But so far, this is rather an untapped opportunity in North America. In 2013, you might like to know, the U.S. was the top buying country for children's edgy games. So let's go on to the catalysts that are driving this very healthy market. Now, of the six catalysts, the three on the left are all hardware-based. Um, advances in devices are enabling rich media edgy games. Um, they are now one billion smartphones in the world. And many markets, including North America, smartphones have overtaken feature phones. Features such as, uh, but that doesn't mean that feature phones aren't a viable stream for edu edu games. Excuse me. Accelerometers, eight millimeter, eight megapixel, twelve megapixel cameras, dual cameras, fast processors, combined with the growth of 4G networks, is making for really good gaming experiences. So content is getting more sophisticated, but as I said, uh, content also such as augmented reality. But as I said, there's also room for the simpler types of edu games that can be completed on a feature phone. Tablet adoption uh, has really been booming. I think you've probably already heard uh, and maybe follow the story of the LA rollout of their tablets. Their first uh, set rolled out in September. They aim to put a tab an iPad in the hands of every one of the 640 thousand students, K-12 K through 12 students, in the L.A. school district. That role that happened to be fraught with some problems. Um, some of the students, not surprisingly, had learned to be hackers. And that's, um, that's put a lot of focus on that particular rollout. But there are other rollouts in Missouri and in Texas and in, I think it was North Carolina, handed out 1,500 amplified tablets just recently, just this year. Personal learning devices, uh, we've seen worldwide 92 brand new personal learning devices in the last two years. We define personal learning devices as devices that are solely dedicated to some form of education. So it's not a tablet where you can check mail and go to Yahoo. It's a tablet or some handheld device, such as a leap pad, that's dedicated to learning. That's its sole purpose. Now, consumer demand for early childhood games, I'm going to keep beating that drum. 
because it is growing, and it is, of course, fueling the whole market. Uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll talk a little bit about the new revenue models and distribution channels and about accelerators and incubators. The accelerators and incubators are rather unique to the North America a mobile edgy game market. So, new revenue models and distribution opportunities. Obviously, when you have more devices, tablets, and PLDs, they need content. And so this is a boon for content suppliers. One of the overlooked channels is home school suppliers. Another one, as I mentioned already, is telecoms or device makers creating value-added services. A value-added service can be something as simple, say, in, in Africa as um, a person signing up for a service that gives them information on the weather so a farmer can know when to plant crops or market prices so they can learn when, when is the best time to plant or not plant. Also, language learning, extremely popular, probably the most popular form of value-added service, mobile learning value-added service. Um, direct carrier billing, again, this is an advantage that the telecoms have, particularly popular in areas with low credit card use because it's so convenient to purchase, and in some areas of the world, the only way people can purchase. But beyond the operating system stores, there are so many venues, as you all know, such as the Amazon App Store. Now, this makes very friction-free purchasing because so many people already have a credit card that they've stored with that Amazon or a, a buying routine. Now, Amazon recently has made improvements in their support for game, develop game developers. They've redesigned their portal for app and game developers, and they provided tools that are helping developers plan and publish and promote their Android games. Now, if it's good for games, it's good for edu games. Um, by the way, about the direct billing, BlackBerry, Google, Microsoft, Nokia, Samsung, they all have direct billing agreements in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. You might notice that there's one that's missing from that list. Um, but back to the Amazon App Store, they intended to have, and I haven't done the count, to have presence in 200 countries by the end of 2013. If you're a North American edu-game developer, this is important for you because this could really extend your reach. I want to say a little bit about crowdfunding. It has definitely become a viable alternative to traditional funding sources. Kickstarter, um, which takes creative projects only, their record shows that about 42, 43%, it varies in the last three years, um, they have a success rate of 42, 43%. And if you look at their stats, games raise the most money. Now, there are three that come to mind that have uh, achieved their funding through Kickstarter. Galvanic, which is a Dublin-based firm but sells in uh, the North America, is a Bluetooth-enabled sensor that uh, are rather an amusing product because it teaches stress reduction while playing a mobile game. Seems a little bit um, unusual. Uh, but they did raise 100000 through Kickstarter. Sleepy Giant didn't get to their 20,000. The smart toy called Ubuli got a very small piece of their capital, 20,000 from Kickstarter, and um, but they did raise several million in other ways. But it is becoming a, a perfectly legitimate way for legitimate developers to uh, get their projects started. Now, of course, there are other options, um, and lots of them. Crowdfunder, MicroVentures, Rocket Hub, uh, Indiegogo. Now, Indiegogo themselves just raised $40 million in an effort to take on Kickstarter, which is way ahead of them, both in investment and in the number of participants. If you're looking into crowdfunding, you might really pay a lot of attention, and maybe you already know about the differences between them. For instance, Kickstarter only funds creative projects. Indiegogo also funds, doesn't have that limitation, so you're up against charity projects, which can be challenging. Indiegogo also has a flexible funding option. Uh, in Kickstarter, as you probably know, 
the um, uh, if you don't reach your goal, you don't get any of the money. That's not quite true in Indiegogo, which a lot of people following funding have mixed feelings about whether they want to participate for that. And if you don't reach your funding, you have to pay a higher rate to Indiegogo. Um, I see a question, is crowdfunding really a viable long-term funding option? Or are they more one-off opportunities? Um, you can go back to crowdfunding, and I talked to a, a person, a head of crowdfunding, who said that many projects do come back because the key in crowdfunding is to have a very discreet project. I want to raise money for this thing. In, in publishing, it could be I needed uh, an artist to create a cover for my book. Then you come back for different pieces. And you can also do that in any of the crowdfunding. Is it a revenue model? It's No, it's more of a funding model rather than a real rending, um, revenue model. Good point. Okay, I'm going to move on. So, EdTech accelerators and incubators. 2013 was really a banner year for the growth of new EdTech accelerators and incubators. Up until this year, or last year, Palo Alto's Imagine K-12 was really the only traditional accelerator that focused on EdTech. But since then, Kaplan has an accelerator that's powered by Techstars. And Kaplan offers mentorship, space, and capital in exchange for a bit of equity. Techstars, of course, has many partners. Um, Pearson's Catalyst, an ed, ed tech incubator, offers Pearson execs as mentors, not a wide range of met mentors, but no equity stake, which can be attractive. Um, they could become a customer, and some people also feel that they could also become um, an acquirer. Zynga um, opened up their CoLab, which stands for collaboration. Their fo first cohort began in September, a five-month-long cohort, and the five companies, let me see, besides Motion Math, there was Kit Adaptive, Locomotive Labs, I think they got 20000 in seed money, and they produced games for special needs, Pluto Media, which was founded in the UWeb Incubator, and Edmundo, which they consider the uh, Facebook for schools. They give guidance on usability, analytics, strategy, pricing. Um, this is really making making quite a dent in some startups getting off the ground. Clement Erdman um, was a speaker in the EdNet 2013 panel that um, my co-founder Sam Adkins chaired about investment patterns. and. He, um, he's, he's a managing director of the First Analysis Corporation Venture Funding, and he said right out loud, the incubators and accelerators are allowing new ed tech companies to get to market that previously would never have gotten off the ground. For example, not that they wouldn't have gotten off the ground, but Mind Snacks, which started out in language learning and is now expanded into geography and and other topic areas, as they said they would. They started out in 2010, as I said, as uh, language learning. They were a graduate of Dream Adventures. Dream Adventures started in 2008. And at that point, many of the ideas they received were sort of ideas on the back of a napkin. But now, most of the applications they're receiving are much more sophisticated. It's interesting that in 2014, Dream Adventures has, uh, is opening a health-related cohort, a topic that is rising tremendously. Ah, thank you for the typo, Michael. Wow, Ed Modo, you're correct. Mango Health. Uh, Mango Health has a medical adherence app. A medical adherence is a huge problem in healthcare today. Uh, in the U.S., they report that 75% of patients do not adhere to the medical regime that um, that their doctors have have provided, which means they're they're not improving or not getting the health care they're really signed up for. 
Mango Health, um, the reward system in Mango Health, when they launched, they already had Target on board, uh, and that helped them a great deal. The reward system is giving you a gift cards or discounts or a chance to donate to a charity, which is kind of a and a um, nice unusual twist, a bit of uh, social funding, you might say. Rock Health opened in 2013. They're one of the new ones. And they consider themselves a full-service startup funding organization. And according to them, they um, are said proudly in their annual report that they created, through their funding, 465 jobs, and they raised 100 million, um, 100 million in funding for their um, companies that they promoted. Okay, now I'm going to shift on. Um, oh, I see Michael. Yes, I play. Yes, 1.5 million for Robotso. Yeah, good example. And actually, we'll talk about that just a little later. Okay, next. So, who's buying, and what are they buying? I rather like um, Jason Oberfest's quote about what game design is really about. Now we're halfway through, and so I think I want to take a minute and just give you another poll. So if I can go up and do this, run a poll for your audience. Because we're going to start to talk about buyers, please vote and tell me your organization, the one that you're from, if it fits any of these five categories. Vote which ones that you're in. Academic, corporate, government, healthcare, nonprofit. Corporate I would consider any game development company. You were nicely kind of spread around. I'm seeing so far 56 for corporate, 56%, 23% for academic, 8% for healthcare, 8% for nonprofit. I'll give you another second. Don't forget to hit submit vote. And then I'm going to stop the voting because it looks like we've kind of reached a watershed. Oh, corporate just went up to 54. Okay, I'm going to punch the stop voting. And thank you very much. Okay. I'll say it again. Consumers are the top buyers worldwide of edgy game package content. In Canada, all but one of the top 50 best selling mobile edgy games for young children. All but one are. <laughs> That's a weird sentence. Are for young children. The one exception. Um, is a brain trainer game. Fifty-three percent of U.S. educame revenues were for early childhood education apps, more than half of all the other types. Pre in the pre-K to two, grade two, math and literacy games dominate on smartphones, tablets, and game consoles. It used to be that the mobile brain trainers were, on, were just about exclusively for adults. But recently, I've been seeing more that advertise that they're for all ages and also advertise that they're for children. And there's some products now that are out just for children or intended for children, but of course adults can use them. Basically, consumers buy anything that they're interested in, tourism, health, fitness, and wellness, cognitive fitness, nature, sustainability, hobbies, cooking, and their expectations for mobile social or mobile local social, MOLOSO, continues to grow. And this is something we've really been watching. Uh, two years ago, we did a location-based learning report, and we saw how this was taking off. And in EduGames, it certainly is taking off, too. The shift to the consumer market is quite interesting. Uh, Scavenger, for example, succeeded in the higher ed market, and now they've moved towards the consumer and mobile products. And as of September 2013, they raised $39.9 million. It was their latest round to drive growth abroad. It is interesting to see the ones that are driving growth abroad, abroad and the international companies that are entering the U.S. and Canadian markets. Healthcare students uh, buy as consumers because when they buy apps themselves and knowledge base and skill base. The expert patient is a 
about a three-year-old, four-year-old term, and it really refers to those of us, probably many of you as well as me, that want to know what's going on, and so they look up a condition or a symptom before they go to the doctor. Many of the um, providers of medical content are now gearing their products not only to medical students and professionals, but also to the expert patients that they know are interested. Um, I see a note from Randall. It means that parents are the main target demographic. You got that right. This is our content trench. In 2012, we counted inventory on virtual shelves, so to speak. So this is just inventory. I want to make that very plain. This is what's on the virtual shelf. And you can see that most of the products were for preschool, 31%, and the next highest was for adult consumers. Now, brain trainers obviously fits in that group. As you got into the middle grades, 3 to 5, 6 to 9, and to 12, the content fell off. We're seeing more now in the middle school years, mainly, I suspect, because of the, um, the state standards. But generally, this content trench still holds true around the world as well as in, the North, in, the, in North America. Let's go on to nonprofits. Nonprofits buy in-house and custom content development services, and they range from the very simple location-based QR code-driven edu games to very complex augmented reality learning games. The three examples I have are all from tourism, because that's such a predominant part of this market. Museums and art galleries really led the way in location-based learning and in location-based games. The one on the right, the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore, had a terracotta warrior exhibit. Many, many of these in museums are for specific exhibits that come and go, or in the case of the Brooklyn Museum, that game, I think, was for a, a permanent exhibit. I'm not positive about that. The Murder at the Met, which is a game created by Green Door Labs, was for a specific area of the museum. Nonprofits also create games about disease prevention, the environment, and social engineering, and any other social issue. But particularly, cultural institutions focus on edu games for galleries and so forth. Very large market. This, of course, is the market that started with those little wands, audio guides. But as more and more people came back in their own phones, the idea that you can download a an app about an exhibit that you're going to see before you go to a museum or in the museum and then have it later has proved <coughs> excuse me, very attractive to consumers. Nonprofits are buying them, I should mention, but consumers are using them. So we want to be very careful to separate who's buying and who the intended user is. Some of these products are for sale and others are provided free. Depends on the um, the business model of the institution. Governments. Governments also buy um, services, content services, and location-based edu games for tourists. So both nonprofits and governments buy these. The example I have on the right is from the Canadian um, Heritage Found Foundation, the Department of Canadian Heritage. They funded this. There is an area in Quebec of 29 very small museums. So they banded together, um, created an app that was funded by the Department of Canadian Heritage to introduce people to those 29 museums with the idea that if you visited one, you might visit another. So what was the reward at the end? Readmission to another museum, if you got 15 answers right. Now on the left, we have an example that the, um, the US uh, CDC, Center for Disease Control has sponsored a series of games that are to promoting healthy habits and help patients with chronic diseases. This one is about teen smoking. And to me, Bird Brawl 
well, those birds look rather annoyed. One might almost say they look angry. They've also produced other, uh, I think there's one called word weather, which is a race against clock, race against the clock. It's meant as a distraction game, but it's also a learning game. When a teen feels the urge to smoke, uh, the idea is to play the game and get some distraction and learn a little bit along the way. Um, the federal government funds games, and also they have the military. They also, of course, their market is also a civilian market as well as military. And state and local, as I said, also fun games, so all levels of government. And as, as from the earlier slide on our taxonomy, we separate in our market forecast federal government from state or provincial and local governments. Another one that um, the federal government did um, called Trace, Trace Word Soup, and that was done by the Office of English Language Program in the U.S. government. It was their first ever mobile app. Move on to the academics. Academics, particularly by knowledge-based and skill-based games. There's some location learning games. Amplify, filament games, logical choice technologies, edupads, and now um, Benesse America are pretty prominent in this market. Uh, logical choice technologies has created some interactive online curriculum supplemental software and services, including the Math Alive classroom curriculum app, I think which has about 40, 45, 45 skill-based interactive augmented reality games. Um, Michael, you're asking about why ARGs haven't grown as much. I, I meant augmented reality, uh, augmented reality games. Um, I think, don't, don't know this for a fact, but I think it's because Augmented, we expected augmented alternate reality. Okay, pretty much the same thing in, in my book. Um, I suspect it's because we expected that, you like that super better, <laughs> we expected that um, new devices would come with a AR browser installed so it would be an easier sell, so to speak. Um, they are expensive to produce. That's another reason why it may have been a little slow to market. But I suspect that because the technology wasn't sort of there really as a ready basket, um, for instance, phones now are coming equipped with near um, near field communications, NFC. A killer app for HW feature. Good point. Um, who else? Now, it's interesting that there's a growing international interest in the North American market, which means if you're in the North American market, you have even more competition than you had last year. Edupad, which is a French company, they produce the I touch, or I touch math and language art games, and they're focused on the elementary and junior high school. They were, I think, number one in the Windows Store. Um, one of their claims to fame is that they're integrated with the Apple Game Center, which makes it easier to share scores. Benesse is Japan's largest educational company. They entered the U.S. market in November of 2012. Um, I mentioned tablet use is expanding in U.S. schools and personal learning devices. LeapPad is the predominant one for the early grades. Let's see what else do I want to tell you. Um, academics buy package content generally. They, they do not create their own content. Now, higher education institutions have experimented with mobile edu games, and they certainly have driven the market with their... Uh, development of free um, tools and apps and experimented with apps. But so far, they've been very slow to adopt them into the curriculum. Uh, University of New Mexico created Mentira, which is a, a Spanish language learning game where students go out into, into the community and solve a mystery, and they have to talk to people. Um, I see a note about simulation-based learning, e-learning. Uh, for us, that's a totally separate topic uh, than game-based learning. Simulation-based um, learning is not, not a game. It doesn't have gameplay mechanics. If it does in a virtual environment, then we call it an edu game. 
But that's a whole separate topic that interests me too. So let me go next. Healthcare. I've already mentioned students. Um, but I want to say about the healthcare market how much it is shifting. Um, the pharmaceutical companies have focused in the past to how many drugs sold, how many products sold. Not that they're not focused on that, but now they're focused more, and a lot of it is because of government regulation and the Affordable Care Act. They're focused on improving health outcomes, and they can do this with mobile games by engaging patients. It used to be that the pharmas were the main um, source of funding for learning technology products in general. That has worldwide as well as in North America, that has kind of calmed down as there's been more and more criticism of possible um, oh, in, undue influence by doing products on um, that promoted one of their products, doing an edgy game product or any app that promoted one of their products. Um, providers and payers also are more focused on outcomes and providing services and improving efficiency because they are in a very competitive environment. More and more insurance companies, by the way, are buying um, hospitals, and this is really changing the market too. And as I mentioned, medical adherence, adherence is becoming a very hot topic, therefore a good topic. The healthcare market in general is very complex and very very opaque. We did a very large report on mobile learning in the healthcare market, and it's a fascinating market because it covers so many of the other buyer segments all in one. Move on. Corporations, they generally buy services, but not real fast. And we think that they're they're not buying them because the shrinking training budgets is still a problem. Obviously, twenty um, the re the recent recession didn't make things any easier, but also the negative perceptions that are still per persisting. The myth that they're too costly, too difficult to integrate. Employees are too old, therefore they're not interested. Or women don't play mobile games. Well, those last two definitely are patently not true. Um, there is a 40% um, of the people playing Candy Crush and Bejeweled. No, no, that's not true. It's not 40%. Um, women over 40 definitely are playing Candy Crush and Bejeweled and other games more and more. So the, the women gaming market is growing, whereas it used to be, you know, just um, young men. Now, they're mainly playing word games, puzzle games. They're not playing World of Warcraft or Call of Duty, that's true. But these myths still persist. Um, use cases that are popular are, or where it's appropriate, um, corporations find, are in sales, new employee orientation, and a little management training. But particularly in major brands trying to create affinity with their customers by sponsoring a product that appeals to their consumer base. There again, they're creating them, the consumers are using them. Game up, good point, yes. Yeah, Sesame Workshop. Um, just reading your notes as I'm doing this too. So, what are the challenges? Obviously, discoverability is a huge, huge challenge. Uh, Google Play boasted launching their one millionth app. And the entrance into the market still flooding the market with one- and two-person shops, hobbyists. It makes it more and more difficult to get visibility. That's why the Amazon App Store is trying to help developers um, with, their, uh, with their games it is an important move. So what comes out of this? The suppliers are seeking more ways to differentiate themselves, and one that we see again and again is backed by science claims, not just in brain trainers, which is very, very prevalent, but also in math and language arts and the products dedicated to or focused on young children. 
the Back by Science claims gives a parent a little confidence. I'm spending money on something that is going to be good for them, not just feel good. And about the pricing, people are willing to pay a little more for an edgy game than they are just for a game game. Now, the challenges in the academic sector are more unique. There's a highly fragmented purchasing environment, both in Canada and the U.S., that makes it very difficult to uh, to sell broadly. There are social and culture structures within the academic community. Um, devices are banned, or when you can use them, how you can use them, and the availability. Are there enough devices? Uh, can parents afford to buy the devices? If they can't afford devices, there are a lot of complex problems, social issues that have to be solved. And attitudes. Administrators, teachers, you know, may be fearful that, uh, well, if they're having a lot of fun, are they learning something? I think we all know different. There's also attitudes of students, particularly in the higher grades. If they sniff that an edu game is good for them, well, that really uh, reduces their interest in playing it because it's good for them. Um, and a real big one is support for teachers to use edu games within the classroom, something that we're seeing suppliers starting to pay attention to. Um, privacy and purchasing, growing issues, one I could spend an entire session on. Um, attitudes about privacy are, are very binary. Some people obviously care a whole lot. Some people don't care at all. But there is a growing base of privacy-aware people. Um, suppliers need to stay up to date with the legislation. The UK, uh, I just read today, the Office of Fair Trading has published their guidelines. They were released in September for comment. Their guidelines for mobile for the mobile application industry. For games and apps, those developers have until April the 1st to comply with them. And this particularly covers in-app purchases. Um, Apple just agreed to a $32.5 million refund to parents for the kids' in-app spending sprees. Um, this was got quite a lot of attention. The biggest kid spender was a child that spent $2,600 in a single game. So they are changing, and, and some I'm seeing some products and in in-app purchases that that some products for children that advertise that they don't offer an in-app in -app purchase because I don't want parents to freak out. But the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act in the U.S., the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Distribution Act uh, has been in place in Canada since 2004, which re reinforces the existing um, requirements for the uh, European Union privacy directives are things to really pay attention to. So um, a little more on challenges for educators. Technical challenges, um, this cartoon, I think, um, really replayed what uh, one of the panelists said at, at EdNet 2013. I'm not synced. I have no Wi-Fi connection. And, and the favorite one, my battery is dead. So obviously problems that have to be overcome. And the one on the right, uh, students saying, hey, you know, look what I could do. I can do this on my device. And the teacher being a little antiluvian said, oh, that's nice, but I have some, I've had something like that for years, a blackboard, very interactive and so forth. But it's not just the attitude. So some of these attitudes are fear-based. And products that are now inviting support for teachers and supplying it, I think it's Amplify that really has taken this on in a big way. And they offer a professional development service. So not only can you sell a product, but you can also sell a service. And as we know from back in our days of uh, open source, Red Hat made most of their money in selling services because the product was free. And this is a, a wonderful opportunity to sell those services that will help teachers. How do you integrate it in the classroom? How do you use it? How do you use it effectively? And then beyond that, of course, there are IT consulting services and all that. So I see I've got 10 minutes left. I'm going to whiz through the trends to watch. I'm going to give you a chance to ask questions. And if you don't, that's fine, too. One, free tools. Um, free tools, 
has really, really opened up the market because it's excited the market. Uh, Disney's new toy box and and action. Uh, you can purchase an Infinity toy, get an unlock code, and buy characters. This is a huge step for Disney that also always was extremely jealous about their um, licensed properties. Sketch Nation Studio is a free iPhone app, and the company will publish and advertise your game for 50% of the revenue. So this is a free plus monetization. Uh, game Salad is another do-it-yourself mobile platform for both professionals and amateur game developers. No coding required. I'm going to go to the next one. Uh, DYI is do-it-yourself. And this has been particularly interesting. We are moving in education and in our in our culture towards a creator economy where we don't have to just passively consume as we did with television. Of course, television is getting more interactive. But the idea of actually creating games and as part of a learning experience. Um, Haikitsu, Code of the Warriors from Kuat Studios is an adaptive gaming platform for $2.99. Kids can learn JavaScript while customizing and battling their robots. Very appealing. Now, I don't want to say this is the dark side, but this is something to watch. In 2011, 8% of the families in the U.S. had um, tablets. 2013, that went up to 40%. So we're seeing quite a growth in tablets, and just like television, a lot of parents use them for an extremely convenient um, babysitter, and if they have educational products, that's good too. So suppliers are responding to parents' desire to be involved and to know what kids are doing and their apps. But the involvement too, uh, picture a parent at work and their kid is using an app and the parent can see in a dashboard at, at work, during their lunch hour, I assume, um, that the child has just achieved a new level in a math game. It can send them a note. Way to go. So it key, it's an interactive opportunity between parents and kids who are separated during the day or just separated for an hour. Or, And so the, re, the parent involvement in the kids' edu games is certainly increasing. Um, Data, the rich data sets, as long as it's anonymized, um, is a real great resource for parents because parents can be offered data on how their kids are using, as I mentioned, but also to drive product improvement. What are people getting hung up on? What What's not working for them? And um, Yogi Play provides anonymous data to their development customers. So this data has been very, very useful. So a little more on the learning game as baby, babysitter model. Parent zones such as uh, Duck Duck Moose, Kids Zone Studios, Guru Play School, Fingerprint Digital. Well, Fingerprint Digital has a shared, um, shared, um, a sharing platform built in. Um, the PBS Play and Learn have a area for parents, or in the PBS example and something that parents can play with toddlers. And there's a wonderful brand, PBS, reported 162,000 downloads in the first month. But these, being able to use the data in creative ways has become an interesting trend in itself. And it also means this whole trend is paying attention to what customers want. When you realize that when Netflix came out with their change in pricing model where they separated their two, their online and their, their DVD businesses, 800,000 people said no and canceled their subscriptions. And Netflix changed. So consumers are much more, um, I'd say, alert nowadays to what they like and what they don't like. Last trend, I think, um, the trend for smart toys. Now, whether these are personal learning devices or whether they are um, smart toys, a lot of discussion about that. Um, Yubuli has a smartphone for a brain. goes into a nice, soft, cuddly little animal, tells stories, teaches math, even teaches a skill-based um, learning, proper toothbrushing techniques. 
the Tiggly iPad is a physical interaction with the iPad. And they started with 500000 in in uh, seed money, started selling in North America, European Union, Australia in November 2013. And not only in the Apple retail store, but on Nordstrom.com, which I thought was particularly interesting. Now, I want to take literally 40 seconds and show you the SK Telecom smart toy. I've included the... Um, the link here so that you can watch it. Now, if I do this correctly, close the program, and I share YouTube. I hope I didn't just go out of this altogether. Uh, this, give me a second, and I'll put the URL in. Hang on for a minute. Almost there. Let me just check the URL. All right, PAB. Got it. Let's see that this works. It is something that's happening. All right. Now, if I'm lucky, uh, it's going to take me just a second to get back. And I hope I haven't lost the presentation. Presentation. I think we're almost there. Yay. Two. Okay. Live by technology, die by technology. Last thing, I actually showed these two cartoons at the Serious Play conference last um, last August, but um, worth repeating, I think. And. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. But before, I just want to remind you that you can download the presentation. We'll have it up by Friday. You can also download an executive summary, a free executive summary um, of, the, of the report that these information was drawn from and our learning, techno uh, learning technology taxonomy from our resource library, ambientinsight.com. Okay, um, fast questions. And if you don't have a question, that's fine. Um, I just add that we, you might check out our resource library in general because we put all our presentations up there. We don't require you to register. You just go get what you want. If you want to drop a note and say, uh, give some feedback, that's always appreciated. Um, can I tell you what textbook publishers are looking for in the K-12 market? What is that market looking for? Um, not, I don't think I could really answer that. I'm not the right person. A unless you look at what is selling, and then from that point of view, the early grades, pre-K mm -hmm. through three in mm -hmm. particular. Because those, those are the ones that are selling the most. Any other questions? Otherwise, we 
want to thank Tyson for spending an hour with us, and um, I hope all of you will come and hear her speak because we definitely want her to come back to the Serious Play Conference, which this year will be at USC, July 22 to 24. If any of you have a topic that you think you might want to speak about, the registration is now open for speakers as well. So thank you very much, Tyson, and thank you all for attending. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this.